It has been an upset-filled college basketball season. But in the tournament, the top seeds have prevailed. But Cinderella has failed. Locked On Podcast Network presents the 2024 NCAA Bracket Breakdown. Presented by Nissan. Welcome into the Bracket Breakdown Sweet 16 Preview. I'm your host, Tanitra Batiste. Alongside me, our Locked On College Ball Basketball hosts, Isaac Shade and Andy Patton. Bracket Breakdown is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. So guys, let's start by taking a look at how we got here and what have been the most impressive parts of this NCAA tournament so far. Andy, let's head out Midwest first and talk about Purdue's dominance, a 106-67 win over Utah State thanks to a monster, another monster game, another two-way game from Zach Eady. Yeah, the Midwest region has, has more or less been, been chalk. Uh, Oregon made a nice upset. They, they, they took down South Carolina. That was a big win for them. Nearly took down Creighton. But for the most part, the Midwest region has been kind of one of the more, for lack of a better word, boring regions. But I, I don't think you can call what Purdue and Zach Eady have done in their first two games boring by any stretch, especially after – kind of exercising the demons from last year, losing to the 16 seed. What does it look like this year? Are they going to do what Virginia did and roll all the way to the national championship? Are they going to lose early again? Is that going to start, you know, raising some serious questions about Matt Painter and this Boilermakers team? Uh, instead, they take care of business against the 16 seed, which we all kind of expected. I don't think anybody realistically thought that was going to happen two years in a row. Uh, but then against a, a tough upstart Utah State team, a team that Isaac and I both discussed as, as feeling like they were a little underseeded as an eight seed and Utah or excuse me, Purdue just rolled over them in, a, in an incredible way. Zach Eady had a 20.10 rebound double-double at halftime. Yeah. He barely even played in the second half because they just didn't need him to because they were up by so many points. This Purdue team is different than last year's Purdue team. I know they have the majority of the same players back, and so it feels like it's kind of the same group. But those freshman guards are now sophomores and have improved dramatically. Uh, the addition of Lance Jones from Southern Illinois is a transfer. He's been a, a huge much needed addition for them, just adding some athleticism on the wing and some outside shooting. And and what they did to Utah State, uh, it sets up a really fun matchup against Gonzaga, one of the only other upsets, if you can call it that, a five <laughs> over a four seed uh, in Gonzaga beating Kansas, a, a very depleted Kansas roster without Kevin McCuller. And, and Gonzaga back in the Sweet 16 nine years in a row. That's another great storyline uh, coming out of this Midwest region. I'm really excited about Purdue-Gonzaga. I think that's a fun matchup. These two teams play each other way back in November in the Maui Invitational. Gonzaga actually had a five-point lead at halftime, ultimately lost yeah. by 10. But I, I think you look at the Midwest region and really the big storyline is Purdue. Uh, it's Oregon coming very, very close to making the Sweet 16, took Creighton to double overtime. Uh, the fun yeah. storyline there, Dana Altman, former head coach at Creighton for about 15 years, now the head coach at Oregon, got to play his old school there. But, but really... The Midwest region has been dominated by Purdue, and we'll see if they can continue to do that against this Gonzaga team. Yeah, and I think you make a great point, Andy. I mean, just having the opportunity to watch Zach Eady and some of the things that people don't know, he's got some decent ball handling skills. He mm -hmm. was actually able to help Trey Kaufman Wren here and there with ball movement for the Boilermakers. I think that's a really cool thing to know about a big man, a seven-footer, no doubt. But, yeah, some fun things going on. You know, like you said, Andy, it was kind of chalked. The Midwest was kind of – doing Midwest things, which you expected uh, that particular region to do. But, you know, Isaac, when we look across that space of East-West, I might have gotten a little bit ticky-tacky here and there, but there was one team that stood head and shoulders above the rest. Yeah, as, as we go to the East, whew, the number one overall seed UConn yeah. Huskers have proven in both of their outings why they're the number one overall seed, doing what you expect out of them in the 16 game. But my goodness, what they just did to Northwestern on Sunday and the way Stefan Castle, freshman stud, just shut off the water for Boo Booey, who's one of the greatest guards in the entire nation, was something of an incredible performance. Donovan Klingen is finally fully healthy. He's a big man uh, for UConn that just had a ridiculous like 14 points, 14 rebound, eight block performance against Northwestern. Tanitra, it was an insane 
um, performance from them overall in the East. There were zero seed line upsets in the round of 32 yeah. tied with uh, the Midwest that Andy just talked about for the chalkiest quartet. <laughs> in the I love it. We've got the one, two, three, and five, which is San Diego state. Speaking of San Diego state, we had six mountain West teams in this tournament. The Aztecs uh, are the lone remaining member of that conference. And it's all because yeah. of Jaden D who was one of the stars of this tournament so far. 32 points in round one, 26 points to cap Sunday night's action. Really, really good stuff. But let's not look too far ahead for UConn because in the bottom half of this bracket, Illinois, the three seed, and Iowa State, the two seed, are playing some of their best, best basketball of the season. Really interesting article that came out over the weekend about how Illinois transformed their offense earlier this season after a conversation with legendary Villanova coach Jay Wright. Consequently, the dynamic duo of Terrence Shannon and Marcus Damask have combined for 90 points in these first two games. Which is absolutely crazy to think of. And you're right. Like there was maybe a little something here and there that was kind of exciting, but it was just momentary because like you said, I think for me, the most exciting thing, and this might sound a little bit crazy because we talked about it on our introductory show, but you know, college basketball doesn't really allow for dynasties anymore. So for me, the exciting part was seeing the dominance of UConn because there's an opportunity for us to see a back-to-back -back champion. So that, to me, was the exciting part of the East, if you will, Isaac, because I knew that we probably weren't going to get anything close to an upset in that space. But then you look at the South, Andy, and you see five of eight first-round games were upsets. I mean, A&M over Nebraska, and you could just go on and on. It just kind of – now, it got a little bit cray-cray over there for a minute at at least in that first round. Yeah, it looked like it was about to get even crazier, potentially Texas A&M pulling off a stunning yeah. upset over Houston. They came Houston, within, we almost had a problem. within inches, <laughs> within inches of pulling off this upset. Really, really fun, fun basketball game. Perhaps the best game of the tournament so far. Uh, but uh, Houston manages to prevail. They're back in the Sweet 16. But yeah, like you said, Tanitra, five of the first uh, eight games. Uh, A&M beat Nebraska. It's a 9-8. Not a huge upset, but still still counts here. James Madison, the 12 seed, picks up the upset win over Wisconsin. Um, NC State, perhaps the best story left in the NCAA tournament. They beat Texas Tech. They then get a chance to play Oakland in the second round because Oakland, of course, upset Kentucky, the 14 seed, over the three seed there. Jack Golke made himself the name of the NCAA tournament, hitting so many three-pointers. Uh, tied or broke Steph Curry's record for most three-pointers in the first two games of an NCAA tournament. I can't remember either way. Uh, it, really incredible performance from him. NC State managed to move on to the Sweet 16 as an 11 seed, a team that was the 10th seed in the ACC coming into the conference tournament. They have not lost since then. Now here they are continuing to dance. We also had a phenomenal fun game between Florida and Colorado, the 7 and 10 yeah. seeds in the first yeah. round. Uh, Colorado ends up winning that one 102 to 100. It felt like whatever team had the basketball last was going to win. And that's more or less what happened. Really fun, really high scoring game. There lots of exciting games in the South region, even though we end up not chalky, not less chalky than the rest of them because of NC state, but it's still a one seed, a two seed, a four seed and an 11 seed uh, representing the South region in the sweet 16. Yeah, to say we're still talking about four number ones and four number twos is mm -hmm. just amazing to me. And, you know, I'm also interested to see, Andy, whether or not this test that Houston had against Texas A&M is actually yeah. going to give them sort of that character build yeah. that you need for a deep run if they're really going to contend against the other number ones. Now, we have a few blue bloods left in this tournament. Are we starting to put Houston in that category for more on their journey? Here's Locked on Cougs. The Houston Cougars keep on dancing. I'm your host of Locked On Cooks Parker Ainsworth. And man, oh man, it is so, so sweet to be in the Sweet 16. Now, how Houston got here is quite an interesting road. Uh, obviously, amidst a bunch of season ending injuries and things like that, Houston came with a statement win over Longwood in the opening round of the NCAA tournament. And as I told you that night afterwards, the bigger statement was going to be made against Texas AM in the one versus nine matchup. AM is not a typical nine seed by any stretch. Uh, they had a crazy good last month of the season to get there. Uh, Houston knocks them off 195 in overtime. Four Houston starters fouled out. The fifth one had four fouls. Guys playing hurt, guys playing through foul trouble. Walk ons like Ryan Elvin stepping in and making free throws in the final minute of overtime to ice the victory. Ultimate culture win for Calvin Sams, the Houston Cougars, who head on to the Sweet 16 in Dallas, just up the road, to play Duke, those Duke Blue Devils and the Blue Blood program they are. Now, Houston's building a Blue Blood of their own. They've got 
the most Final Four in the school in the state of Texas. They're one of the only two Big 12 schools left, the only school in the state of Texas left in all of March Madness. Samson the Cougs are building something here. Five straight Final Fours have – five straight Sweet 16s, I'm sorry, have not missed the Sweet 16 since 2019, including that Final Four trip in 2021. Houston's looking to get back there again with the big win over Duke. And then would either be NC State and Marquette on the other side. Again, I'm your host, Locked On Cougs. We'll be breaking down each and every day at Locked On Cougs. Make sure you subscribe to our your podcast. And as always, go Cougs. Isaac, I'm going to put you in your happy space right away. We're going to talk West and we're going ACC <laughs> because, of course, and yes, Andy, you know, there's a little bit of homerism from these <laughs> two North Carolina fans. But anywho, AC, the ACC has as many teams in this region alone as the SEC Big 12, Big 10 have remaining in the entire tournament. You've got Clemson that's been good Clemson, but you're wondering, is it going to be good Clemson, bad Clemson? And of course, so many other interesting storylines there. But what stuck out to you to get us to this point in the West? Yeah, I mean, Tanitra, you just said it. The biggest storyline out of the West is the two ACC teams. This ACC conference that's been much maligned in terms of its historic performance. And it makes up an entire quarter of the Sweet 16, not to mention, as you said, two of them here in the West region. Clemson, who had been phenomenal in the non-conference portion of this season, just was up and down Clemsoning a little bit through the ACC schedule but they have been the very good version of themselves. Both of their games, despite being a six seed against an 11 in the first round, they were the underdogs. They knocked off the Lobos of New Mexico and then do it again against Baylor on uh, Sunday and move along. Interestingly enough, it's not necessarily been P.J. Hall uh, or Joe Girard, the nation's second leading free throw shooter that's led the way. It's been point guard Chase Hunter, who's had 21 and 20 points in those two games respectively. Point guards win in March, Tanitra. The most interesting first round thing that happened was Dayton's wild comeback to knock off Nevada. The Flyers were down 17 points with seven minutes and 15 seconds to go. The uh, Nevada's win percentage at that point was like 99.6% like a uh, probability. And then Dayton outscores them 24 to four down the stretch to claim that win and move on. Uh, But they just didn't have enough for Arizona in round two and Arizona moving on to that sweet 16, very close to home there in LA. And by the way, Alabama is the other sweet 16 team here. They've won in very Alabama style in game one, scoring 109 points, but surrendering 96 to Nietzsche. And then game two against Grand Canyon, a knockdown dragout fight, 72-61. It was Alabama's second lowest scoring of the entire season. But here's the thing. Those games were Charleston and Grand Canyon. Big step up in competition as they face the Tar Heels on Thursday. Indeed. Coming up, UConn, Purdue, Houston, and Carolina all head to the Sweet 16. How will the big dogs fall? We'll talk about it, but first... This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking out one team that's really stood out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest. Just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs, these guys were able to take it to the next level. The Iowa State Cyclones can only be described as a pathfinder. They've been thrilling to watch and have really created a lane for themselves entering the tournament as one of the hottest teams in the country. They have a date with Illinois this Thursday in the Sweet 16. So take the Nissan Rogue or Pathfinder or Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. The number one seeds in UConn, Purdue, Houston, and North Carolina all advanced to the Sweet 16. But if history tells us anything, Andy, some of them are about to fall before we even get to the Final Four. So who has the toughest path left? Let's start with UConn. Yeah, you know, it's it's funny because UConn, we, we talked about this when we did the Bracket Breakdown show. Isaac and I talked about it on a handful of other episodes. It, it felt like UConn got a pretty tough draw despite being the number one overall seed. Now, obviously, geographically, they didn't have to travel very far, which is definitely a bit of an advantage. But uh, here we are now. They're in the Sweet 16. They got San Diego State. They're playing the team that they played in the national championship last year. That's very rare. This is the fourth time it has ever happened. Uh, the following year, the team, the two teams play each other who played 
uh, in the championship the year before. Uh, I like them against San Diego State, but then they got this 2-3 matchup between Illinois and Iowa State. Illinois, one of the best offensive teams in the entire country. Isaac referenced the Jay Wright conversation, which kind of helped get them there. Iowa State, one of the best defensive teams in the entire country. Reminder, they uh, obliterated Houston in the Big 12 championship game, one of the best teams left in this field. So I still think UConn's got a tough path here just because I think the three teams sitting in front of them, uh, I would put them toe-to-toe with any of the other uh, regions here and say that this is probably the best three teams remaining. Uh, But UConn is also the best team in the field still, and they're playing like the best team in the field, and I still think they're going to get – they're they're going to advance to the Final Four. I still have a lot of confidence in their ability to do so. But, uh, yeah, the the path to to potentially repeating like Florida did back 15 years ago, that's not going to be an easy one for these Huskies. Andy, are you saying that those three, like you would rank them first, second, and third remaining in this entire tournament? Or well, like I'm saying I'd take those three teams up against any of the rest okay. of the three teams, and I would pick that, I think, as the highest quality of teams left. Oh, I was coming with all sorts of arrows for that one, man. So I'm glad <laughs> you cleared that up. Yeah, we, we, we got shots fired, I'm sure, at some point in the show, but just not right now. Right, Isaac? Yes, <laughs> okay. ma'am. I locked on UConn host Mark Zanetto, however, may have some shots to fire. He has a message for anyone complaining about the travel or the start time for San Diego State. You know what? Too bad. So sad. They're going to play up the whole, we're starting early. We don't have a ton of time to um, to prepare. And I, I really do feel like all of the folks that are upset about how, well, San Diego State is in Spokane, Washington. They got to fly back Tuesday or fly back to their um to their campus and then fly halfway across the or all the way across the country to play a, a 745 game, which would most which on their meter is more like a four o'clock game for, for Western time zone. I get all that. But also, if you're looking at from UConn's perspective, UConn is the number one overall seed. They're supposed to get quote unquote the breaks because they earned it. They're 33 and three. They played in the Big East Conference. They did not play in the Mountain West, which got a million bids and did nothing in this tournament. So the idea that we're supposed to now give concessions to San Diego State just because they're in the tournament as a five, give me a break. That's what Dan Hurley's talking about. So there's some truth to what he's saying, even though it is 100% a ploy to build that chip. So our toughness meter as fans has to rise because the further we get in this tourney, the the hate is going to rise even higher. So let's thank people for their engagement on social media, even if they're being disrespectful and watch our guys rise to the occasion as we meet, as they meet their next challenge. Basically what Mark said guy was wah, wah, wah. (laughs) He's just not here for the extra from San Diego state and the rest of this country. UConn, we press on. And speaking of pressing on Isaac, Purdue continues to move on after selection Sunday, UConn in the East had that bracket of death, so to speak. But now some people think it might be Purdue. Uh, yeah, Tinker, look, I like Andy's assessment of that group of three as maybe the toughest group of three. I think this is the toughest group of four because Gonzaga, with all due respect to Kansas, Kansas being shorthanded, can, uh, Gonzaga makes this a tougher quartet than Kansas would have. So Purdue has to get through Gonzaga, and Gonzaga is one of maybe the three or four hottest teams left in this tournament, Tanitra. They've figured it out. They've put it all together. It took them a little bit of time, but that's going to happen when you lose a generational player like they did in Drew Timmy. Like That's just the nature of the beast, but Mark Few is a phenomenal basketball coach and has got this thing figured out. The Bulldogs are rolling. Zach Eady and Graham EK, I know we're not previewing previewing games yet, but that is going to be a fun front court battle. If Purdue is able to get through them, Tennessee and Creighton are both really good and for completely different reasons. So that's a whole different set of ball of wax that Purdue has to deal with. With Tennessee, it's their stellar defense and a much improved offense headlined by Dalton Connect. With Creighton, it's just a bunch of shooters and a guy we call goose egg, right, Andy? (laughs) (laughs) yes mason miller who is the fifth starter that just doesn't score much but does a lot to help set up the other guys and do what they do so either way purdue i think regardless of opponent has the toughest both sweet 16 and elite eight matchup left of these four number one seeds now andy then there's north carolina alabama doesn't exactly defend well enough to stop north carolina but Carolina, hmm, what are some of the things that we look at with them in terms of maybe one of their areas of, I don't want to call it weakness, but something that maybe uh, Alabama might be able to exploit? 
Yeah, you know, I think Alabama is a, a very, very, very good offensive team. They absolutely light up the scoreboard. Yeah. And we've seen Carolina show some dramatic improvement throughout the season on the defensive end of the floor. Huge shout out to Hubert Davis for finding ways to to, to kind of work with the personnel that they had to make this team a better defensive team. And I, I think that Carolina's ability, they don't need to stop Alabama from scoring. You know, They don't need to hold them under they just need to play good enough defense that their offense can can do what they do. And with R.J. Davis and Armando Baycott and Cormac Ryan has come around lately, Elliot Cadell has played phenomenal as a distributor yeah. for this team. Yeah. If this team can just do enough offensively to score 80, 85 points, and again, they're going up against one of the weakest defenses remaining out of the Sweet 16. I fully believe they are, they are capable of scoring that kind of point total. And, and while Alabama is also capable of scoring 80 or 90, I think Carolina's defense is good enough to get them through this game. They'll then take on the winner of Arizona Clemson. Uh, this Arizona team is elite offensively. That is the matchup every single person wants because <laughs> you get the Caleb Love versus R.J. Davis, the two guards who started North Carolina but had some trouble uh, working together in that backcourt. They have both thrived since uh, they are apart from each other. Getting a chance to play against each other with an opportunity to go to the Final Four is an incredible potential storyline to keep an eye on. I love Tommy Lloyd's team. Really, really good. Really athletic athletic, very good offensively, but some of the same situations with Alabama, they're not quite as good on the defensive end of the floor. Uh, while Davis and Love will get the attention, if you get uh, the Umar Balo versus Armando Baycott matchup in the front court, that's phenomenal as well. And then we don't want to discount Clemson either. The ACC has been phenomenal. Why not have two ACC teams squaring off to potentially get into the final four? Worth acknowledging North Carolina and Clemson split in the regular season, and they actually each won on the road. Clemson more than capable of taking care of Arizona, more than capable of beating North Carolina. I don't think that this is as tough of a trio of teams that they have to get through as what Purdue and UConn have to get through, but this is not an easy path for North Carolina. When you get in the Sweet 16, never really is. Yeah. Now we talked earlier about kind of good Clemson, bad Clemson, Isaac. So now we're going to talk about good Duke, bad Duke. <laughs> Houston taking on Duke, and it really is going to depend. The outcome of that game might depend on which Duke we get. That's absolutely right, Tanitra. I mean, they looked to me, perhaps the best they've looked all season on Sunday, ellipsis against James Madison, right? Like, was that more about Duke or was that more about the Dukes? And, and it's hard to know that because that's who we saw Duke play in this game. Jared McCain was an absolute dude. Started yeah. six of six from three, finished with eight three-pointers, 30 points, his second 30-point game of the season. Kyle Filipowski didn't really add a ton, but he didn't have to. Kind of like Andy was saying earlier about um, Zach Eady and Purdue on Sunday. Um, so I, I love McCain. I love what this team's doing. One thing to watch, Jeremy Roach really did something to his pinky, had it taped. I mean, you could hear him screaming on the broadcast of that game. Um, and so ultimately, I think Houston's front court is too physical for Kyle Filipowski, and the guards will come at McCain in waves, in crier sharp and shed. I think Houston does take that. But then we've got either Marquette or NC State. Uh, man, can't count out NC State in this thing. Same thing. He, it's, it's the DJs, right? DJ Horn on the outside, DJ Burns on the inside. Everyone finally got a chance nationally to see DJ Burns. He's a fleet-footed little Cinderella dancing around down there. He can dip out. If you double him, he can take care of business. If you single him, he is a fun, fun, fun basketball player to watch. But Marquette, Tyler Kolek is back, and he's healthy, and he led Marquette on Sunday. So watch out for Houston and Marquette. Uh, but I would still say, for my money's worth, Purdue has the toughest remaining set of games. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out because 2008 is still the only year where all four one seeds actually made the final four. Coming up, who makes the Elite Eight predictions on every game? But first. This Sweet 16 preview is brought to you by our great friends at FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's 200 bucks to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. 
How about some national championship odds? UConn leads the way at plus 210. Houston plus 600. Purdue also plus 600. Arizona plus 850. Tennessee and North Carolina coming in fifth and sixth at plus 1100 and plus 1300 respectively. If you want to get in on that action, just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until somebody cuts down the nets. Now the moment... Our audience has been waiting for its prediction time. So we're going to go rapid fire. Andy, I'm going to start with you. And we're just going to one up them, one down them. Start with the one UConn versus San Diego State. Who you got, Andy? I think just like last time these two teams played in the national championship, give me UConn. Donovan Klingon healthy is just enough to potentially neutralize Jaden Lede uh, for San Diego State. I think UConn advances here, gets another chance uh, to potentially make it to the final four and beyond. I'm right with you, Andy. UConn's the play here. Jaden Ledee should have a great game, but too much firepower from Danny Hurley's teams. Huskies making it to the Elite Eight for the first time for a reigning national champ since 2007. Isaac, is it number three, Illinois, or are we going with the two-seed Iowa State? Here's the thing, Tanitra. I have Iowa State getting to the Final Four in my I bracket. I know! <laughs> but seeing what Illinois has been doing on offense – I don't care how bad their defense is. Second worst remaining defense next to Alabama. Illinois' offense prevails. They move on to the Elite Eight. No, I, I'm I'm in disagreement here. I'm sticking with Iowa State. Uh, I'm sticking with your Final Four team here, uh, the Cyclones. Uh, they, I know they, they didn't play as well against Washington State as maybe people would have expected them to do, but this team is so good defensively. I love when we get these high-level offense versus high-level defense matchups. It's always intriguing to see which side can kind of prevail. For my money, I'm taking Iowa State. I think they're going to do enough to neutralize Shannon and Damask uh, and pull off a victory here and set up what would be a really fun matchup with UConn to get to the Final Four. So, Andy, are we talking about another upset by the six seed Clemson against the the two seed Arizona? You know, I actually am going to go with Clemson in this one. And I think part of it is because Arizona has struggled uh, at times this year. We've seen some inconsistencies from them. Uh, they've played well up to this point in the tournament, but Clemson is just absolutely red hot right now. Uh, I think PJ Hall versus Umar Bala is an incredibly intriguing matchup. Uh, I think Arizona's backcourt is just uh, enough inconsistent at times. The Caleb Love experience uh, has its highs and it has its lows. And I think Clemson is good enough and disciplined enough to be able to, to take down Arizona. Arizona and advance and set up what presumably would be an ACC matchup to get to the final four with North Carolina. Although uh, we'll see if Alabama has something to say about that. <laughs> I'm with Andy here. I think Clemson has found something. They're playing their best. They have all season. All the complimentary parts fit so well together. I got to get my chef's hat like the Clemson band. I love mm -hmm. it. Cheering on Ian Shefflin. Going to be great, but Clemson is going to spoil that Caleb Love reunion with his beloved Tar Heels. Uh, speaking of, so North Carolina, your one seed, Bama, your four seed. Let's see for more on Bama's path forward and the possibility of that upset. Here's Locked on Bama. Hey, it's Luke Robinson with Locked on Bama. Yes, I'm on vacation in Atlantis, but I'm also keeping up with the Tide. I got to go and watch the Tide last night uh, win that big game against Grand Canyon. Look, yeah, it was a big game. Trust me on this. Grand Canyon's better than you think. But, you know, the best thing that came out of that game was that it seemed like Alabama had some other guys step up. They needed that. Mark Sears was carrying the team and carrying the team and carrying the team. All of a sudden, Mo Diabate comes in and he plays lights out. Maybe the best nine-point performance in Alabama history, quite frankly. So they got North Carolina coming up on Thursday night, late game in Los Angeles. It's going to be tough. They've got Armando Baycott. He's incredible. Uh, they've got R.J. Davis. He's incredible. But if Alabama can get out and run and create their own pace, I like the Tide's chances. North Carolina definitely would be the favorite, but don't count out the Crimson Tide for winning this game. I think they definitely have a shot. What say you, Andy? Well, you know, I think – I agree with Luke in the sense that if Alabama can get out and run, can make this attract me, potentially they have an opportunity here. But I'm still rolling with the Tar Heels. Uh, I think that their their overall offensive and defensive balance is just too good compared to Alabama, who struggles on the defensive end of the floor. I have no doubt that Alabama can make this a game and can put some pressure on North Carolina with uh, Mark Sears and his outside shooting and the uh, ability of this team to just really light it up, particularly from beyond the arc. But uh, I, I'm still rolling with the Heels here. I think they're more balanced, and I think that's going to ultimately lead to them winning out here. Andy, are you trying to be punny by not saying you're rolling with the tide there? I like it. Way <laughs> to go. Um, very seriously, Alabama's defense, let's put some more numbers on it. In the entire 68 teams in this tournament, 
the only teams that were worse on defense at Ken Palm than Alabama were all seeded 12 or worse in this tournament. They are by far the worst, like this group, the um, Alabama's defense is what is going to change this game unless they can just get bought in. Something to watch out for. Latrell Reitzel had to leave their round of 32 game with another head injury. Coach Oates has been a little cagey about it so far, so we'll see if he's ready to go for them. Ultimately, RJ Davis and Armando Baycott, the inside-outside combination, just too much when you add in those guys, plus Harrison Ingram, Cormac Ryan, Elliot Cadeau, and that bench headlined by Seth Trimble. And Isaac, you want to talk about hobbled, maybe for different reasons, but we saw hobbled Houston struggle to get by Texas A&M, but they got there. So your one seed Houston going up against whichever Duke team shows up, that four seed, which one takes it? Well, I, I said it earlier. I think uh, Houston's front court is too physical for flip, but what I cannot wait for in this game is the backcourt battle between Proctor and Roach and McCain against uh, Cryer, yeah. Shed, and who am I leaving out? Sharp. My mm -hmm. goodness, that is going to be a dynamic battle in this game. Should be a lot of fun. Yeah, really hope that Roach is fully healthy with the pinky injury. If he's not at 100%, I think that puts Duke's chances, which I, I already think Houston's going to win, but Duke needs Roach at full 100% playing his absolute A-plus basketball. If he does that, if he brings that and can neutralize Shed a little bit, that definitely gives Duke a higher chance. But again, like you said, Isaac, front court matchup, Houston's too strong, too physical. Uh, I, I Duke doesn't, their lack of rim protection, I think, causes them some issues here. And I think Houston, uh, like Tanitra said up at the top, they they kind of get a, a rally the troops moment after narrowly beating Texas A&M. And I think they roll over Duke here uh, and advance to the Elite Eight. And Andy, you talk about some A-plus basketball. You're an 11 seed NC State and you got the whole tournament scared. So you're still here. You're taking on this two seed Marquette. Who, who wins and, and moves on? I'm going to take Marquette, and and I almost hate picking against the 11 seed here. And this this uh, NC State team is absolutely red hot. Uh, Isaac mentioned the DJs, DJ Horn, DJ Burns, some phenomenal basketball. Uh, but also Iguodaro is such a dynamic front court player for Marquette. I think he can really help neutralize some of what Burns is able to do. Uh, I think he's a really tough matchup for NC State to try to defend him. Uh, and Tyler Kolek, just one of the best pure point guards in all of college basketball. Certainly one of the best, if not the best point guards still playing right now in this tournament. And, and he looks fully healthy coming off that oblique injury that he had that caused him to miss the Big East tournament. A fully healthy Tyler Kolek is a nightmare for NC State. I think him and Oso Iguodaro are too much. Uh, and the Wolfpack's dreams, dream run here ends and Marquette advances. Yes, agreed. This is where the uh, the run trying to get their Kemba Walker on just doesn't <laughs> quite keep going all the way like the that UConn team did. It's going to be a fun game. I don't think it's a blowout, but Marquette makes enough plays. I wouldn't be surprised to see some really nice pick and roll between Kolek and Igadaro trying to get DJ Burns moving in space, get him out away from that basket, see what they can do there. Give me the Golden Eagles, Shaka Smart moving on. So no Jimmy B magic situation from back in the early 80s. I hear you guys. And of course, the number one seed Purdue against the fifth seed Gonzaga. Who walks away from that and moves on? Well, I, you know, Andy's going to be very sad to hear me say this, but the way <laughs> Purdue is playing right now with Zach Eady, I talked about that Zach Eady Graham EK matchup earlier. Gonzaga is so hot right now. They're playing their most connected basketball, but unfortunately they're coming up against this Purdue Boilermakers team that is just rolling. I am curious to see though, how those sophomore guards hold up. They've done so much better this year. Braden Smith and Fletcher Lawyer, can they handle it in this game? That will be telling to me, but ultimately I think they can do it and Purdue wins a very narrow game. Call me a homer if you want, but I'm going to take Gonzaga in this one. And <laughs> part of the reason here is Gonzaga was playing some of their – they did not start the year off well. Some of their worst basketball came at the very beginning of the season. Yeah. Uh, they had that loss to UConn, the loss to San Diego State, loss to Purdue, all losses that had the fan base in a panic. And yet, guess what? All those teams are still here in the Sweet 16. Maybe those weren't so bad losses uh, after all. Uh, Gonzaga was up five at halftime against Purdue, and that team played a completely different style. Looking back at the box score – for Gonzaga Purdue in November, it looks like a completely different team. They took 32 three-point attempts in that game. Isaac, Graham E.K. took four two-point field goals. He took six three-point attempts. 
That no. is a completely different basketball team Wild. than the team that's playing right now. Dusty Strummer played 30 minutes. Ben Gregg played 21. Like, this team is completely different now than the team that played Purdue back then. Having said that, is Graham E.K. going to be able to score his typical 22, 23 points against Zach Eady? Probably not. But Ryan Nemhart's ability to navigate the, the mid-pick and roll that they have been doing since that Kentucky game, which has just been lethal because teams go under on the screens, but Nemhart can't hit the three. But if they run that thing from the, the free throw line, that has created a lot of problems for opposing teams. Now, Edie's huge. He's long. He's able to navigate pick and rolls better than people give him credit for. It's going to be a huge problem for Gonzaga. If they get in foul trouble in the front court, they're probably done. But if they do not, and if they find ways to run that mid pick and roll, and they run a completely different stylistic offense than they did the last time they played, when again, they almost beat them. I think Gonzaga can roll here, can advance to the Elite Eight and Purdue season early. Uh, once again, there's going to be a lot of conversations about why Purdue can't break this breakthrough here, but this Gonzaga team's playing some great basketball, and I think they could win here. It's survive and advance. And Isaac, we're looking at the three seed Creighton, two seed Tennessee, who survives and advances. This is my second favorite game of the Sweet 16. The one we just talked about is number three. My favorite, though, is Illinois, Iowa State. Can't wait for that one. But this is number two. Tennessee, Rick Barnes just gets past his former team over the weekend. Texas in the battle of the wrong colors of orange out there. Uh, very excited for this one. I think Tennessee's defense is the uh, story of this game. Able to hold down Creighton just enough. Tennessee's offense has just enough. Ultimately, Rick Barnes' defense is moving on. I'm expecting a big game for Dalton Connect, who didn't really do Dalton Connect things in rounds one or two, but it should be a lot of fun to see this game. I'm going to disagree once again. I'm going to go with Creighton here on this one. I, th I think uh, neither team played phenomenal in their last game. Creighton certainly needed two overtime to get by Oregon. That was uh, not the best game that they have played, but I think their ability to space the floor, they can put some pressure on Tennessee's defense. Ryan Kalkbrenner to me is the biggest key in this game. The tied for the biggest key with Dalton Connect. Connect is always a huge key just because if he's not going, Tennessee is not going offensively. But I think if Kalkbrenner can play physical, can battle for some rebounds, can keep Jonas Adu in check, I, I think there's a real chance that that a Creighton team could play through Kalkbrenner, use that ability, use Tennessee's defense squeezing on him to shoot some outside shots. If they're hitting their threes, if Shireman and Ashworth are playing well, give me Creighton to advance here uh, to, the, to the Elite Eight. For more on the Vols path moving forward, here's Locked On Vols. Hey, it's Eric Kane with Locked On Vols. And what got Tennessee to the Sweet 16 was what has gotten Tennessee to dozens and dozens of wins over the last couple of years, and that was defense. Now, you never want to shoot less than 35% from the field, and you never, ever again want to shoot 12.5% from three, but that's where Tennessee was, yet it was still good enough to go on to the Sweet 16 and still good enough to beat Texas in the round of 32 because the Volunteers played smothering defense, won the battle of the boards, uh, won, won the turnover battle in terms of scoring points off those turnovers. Zakiah Ziegler stuffed the stat sheet in a number of different ways, and Dalton Connect, though he wasn't fantastic, he had a couple of late free throws, which were really critical for Tennessee in that win against Texas. Now, again, you don't want to make a habit of going cold from the field, but Tennessee's defense, Rick Barnes' defense is what got Tennessee to the Sweet 16, and I really like this matchup against Creighton, and if you can get by Creighton, I like the balls against Purdue if whoever plays Purdue, including Tennessee, gets a fair whistle uh, against Zach Eady and some of those other bigs for Purdue where I don't think a lot of teams in the country have gotten that fair whistle throughout the season. So uh, Tennessee is a dangerous team. Tennessee can win in a lot of different ways, and Tennessee has Dalton Connect, but it was the defense that told the tale for Tennessee in the round of 32. For more information on Tennessee basketball and the run throughout the Sweet 16 and the NCAA tournament, check out Lockdown Vols. All right, guys, time for our final predictions for the final four. Who, Andy, makes it to Saturday, April 6th? Well, I didn't want to pick three Big East teams because that feels ridiculous. But looking at the matchups here, I have UConn advancing in the East. I think Marquette is going to get by NC State, and I could see them taking down either Houston or Duke. So give me Marquette up there. Give me Creighton taking down Tennessee and taking down, in my bracket, Gonzaga, potentially Purdue in that one as well. And then give me the heels coming out of the West region being the only non-Big East team in what would be an insane Final Four. Isaac, who makes your final four? I'm just marveling at Andy. That's incredible. Three biggest teams in the tournament. I didn't want to go three one seeds, so I decided, you know what? Let's go three biggest teams. What That's a fun. story. Dude, I'm all in on that, Andy. Let's <laughs> see that happen. Um, since I changed my pick to Illinois uh, from my original bracket, I actually like UConn over Illinois in that matchup. 
So give me the Huskies now. Allie, our, our producer, Allie, is going to be very happy about that. <laughs> I do think the Tar Heels come out of the West, as Andy said. Um, I'm sticking with my Tennessee pick over Purdue in the Elite Eight and then got to ride with Houston still in the South. For more, check out your favorite Locked On College show and make sure you follow and subscribe to Locked On College Basketball, your team every day.